All righty. We are continuing in our uh, study through the book entitled The Acts of the Apostles, a wonderful transitional book in the New Testament. Must watch as we go through this book. It's easy to get confused because it's an historical book, not a doctrinal book. So as we weave through it, we have to be very careful to rightly divide whether God is dealing with the nation Israel or building his church. And right now we're still in the part where God is dealing with the nation Israel. We're in Stephen's story. Uh, we see in chapter 6 and 7, they're kind of connected as the story of Stephen, his saga, is presented for us. In the sixth chapter, we see Stephen called to be a servant of the Lord in the early developing church and yet at the same time reaching out to the nation Israel. We see uh, later in the sixth chapter, Stephen the witness, as he's witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And now we see Stephen in the seventh chapter being called before the council, the Sanhedrin, and the high priest questioning him with verse 1. Then said the high priest, are these things so? These charges brought up against you. And we see Stephen in the first 50 verses here has what I call a a scriptorium. He's going to give a history like a historian of scripture to these people. Um, uh, I write it here in uh, Stephen the Scriptorian in Acts chapter 7. And we'll see as he weaves his way through the uh, history of the nation, uh, verses 1 through 19, he will, he will cover the patriarchs. Uh, we began last week, we were working our way through this chapter. I believe we finished up in verse uh, 14. As uh, Stephen was weaving through the history of the nation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob going down into the land of Egypt, Uh, meeting uh, Joseph, and the second time Joseph, verse 13, the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren. And Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh, and then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. And we read through that last week. Some people consider that a problem text in the Bible. And if you listen to the tape last week, you will see that there really is no problem, that the Bible does not contradict itself. So, we're continuing today looking at Stephen the Scriptorian going through the patriarchs, and we pick it up in verse 15. And it says, And so Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. Verse 16, And were carried over into Sychem, that's Shechem, and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, that's Hamor, the uh, father of Sychem, that's Shechem. The names are often changed a little in the New Testament. Uh, There are reasons the Lord does that, and he just wants us to study to show ourselves approved and understand these things. So now Stephen is recalling the fact that, that Jacob took his kindred, went down to meet Joseph, Joseph became known unto them the second time. One of the themes we spoke of last week is you'll find the highlight of the second. Uh, We saw that the second sons were the one accepted. We see that it's the second coming. We see that it's the second time. There's going to be, uh, watch for the second, because two seems to be God's number in working with mankind. It's like we don't seem to get things the first time. He has to come to us a second time. Verily, verily, the Lord would say unto us so often. So, so now we see the nation of Israel in Egypt, uh, 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 beginning with just uh, 70 plus souls. And it says, verse 17, But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham. Now, God had made a promise to Abraham back in the 15th chapter of Genesis. And one thing we're going to learn about uh, the Lord, if you turn back to Genesis 15, one thing you'll learn about the Lord is the Lord is a covenant-keeping God. And in the recording of the history, as Stephen records it, you're going to find so often that the people may drift from the promises of God, but God always stays true to His promises. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, the Lord had made a promise to Abram uh, around 1900 and something B.C., and uh, in this particular chapter, verse 1, And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. It's the first time you ever see the, the phrase, the word of the Lord, is right here in Genesis 15, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Abram. 
Verse 6, And he, Abram, believed in the Lord. And he, that's the Lord, counted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. And we learn right here, very carefully defined, in the Scriptures, the first time he ever refers to the word of the Lord is in the first verse. And this is what Abram believed. He believed the word of the Lord. That's what the faith was counted for righteousness. If you want God to count you righteous to having the proper faith in his sight, it is a faith that believes what he has spoken and what he has written. That's faith in God's sight. Believing in the word of the Lord. Faith is not believing in God. Uh, The devil's belief. Faith is not just uh, believing what your church says. Faith is not believing what's in your heart. Faith is believing in the Word of the Lord. When the Word of the Lord comes to you and you believe what is written down, the phrases that say, Thus saith the Lord. The phrases that say, And Jesus said unto him, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When you believe the Word of the Lord, it will be counted to you for righteousness. That's true righteousness in God's sight. It's the first time we see it. Now, in this passage here, the Lord is going to make a covenant with Abram Verse 12, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and and horror of great darkness fell upon him. In this particular covenant, it's going to be a unilateral, unconditional covenant that God is going to make. It's unilateral because Abram's asleep. Lateral means side. Uni means one. It's a one-sided covenant that God is making while Abram is asleep. Folks, uh, God has made some promises to us while we were asleep. We were asleep in our sins spiritually. We're often asleep even as born-again Christians. It says, awake to righteousness and sin not. We're often asleep as born-again Christians. And yet God has made covenants with us through Jesus Christ that he's going to keep. Here's a covenant he makes with Abram while Abram is asleep. Verse 13, he said unto Abram, Abram's asleep, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them four hundred years and also that nation whom they shall serve, that's Egypt, will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. Verse 16, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. They will come out of Egypt and come back to the promised land. Now this is the promise that God is making with Abram. This is the Abrahamic covenant that Stephen is referring to here in Acts chapter 7. We turn back to Acts chapter 7, verse 17. He says, When the time of the promise drew near, drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, This is the promise. God is keeping this promise. Stephen is saying, although the patriarchs, Abraham, uh, Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, any of the patriarchs, Judah, any of them drifted and wandered, God was going to keep his part of the covenant. And when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn, verse 17, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Now, I want you to indulge me. I want to stop here a minute and I just want to show you some things because when I look at the Scriptures, you know, I, I look and I'm pondering the, the word of the Lord that's being given, understanding historically a truth that occurred, but also asking God, is there something here prophetically, is there something here doctrinally that I can pick up which will have application to the present and maybe even to the future? Because it says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And in the testimony of the book, which is written about Jesus Christ, will be prophetic utterances. And there's one right here in this 17th verse, which is very interesting, that I kind of stumbled upon a number of years ago, and I want to share it with you if if you'll allow me to. We're looking here in Stephen the Scriptorian recording the history of of the patriarchs in verses 1 through 19. And he says, When the time of the promise drew nigh, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Now the first thing to understand is that there was a population growth spurt that the Jews went through in the time they were in Egypt. As he just said earlier, they came down with about 70 plus souls in verse 14. 
But now, when the time draws nigh for God to deliver them, the people are growing significantly. When, when they actually left the promised land, it's recorded for us in Exodus. I've got to find the verse here. It's uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. Amen, brother. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37, you will see that at the time of their deliverance, when God does deliver the people from Egypt, it says in verse 37, And the children of Israel journeyed from Hermeses to Sukkoth about 600,000 on foot that were men, beside children. Now, I did the math carefully. And um, if you had 600,000 men, and most of those men were married, and each one of those families had only two children, you would have approximately 2,900, 2,985,000 plus people, somewhere in the vicinity of 3 million Jews that were being delivered at that time. Now, I, I, was, I did a little math here, and I figured out that they only had about six generations that they lived in Egypt. And in six generations, they went from a, a number of uh, 70 plus to a number of 2,985,000. Uh, what that works out to be is an average of each family having 12 kids on a regular basis. I mean, that's a growth spurt. That's population growth. That is significant. Now, God had promised when the time of the promise drew nigh, He says the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt. So the first thing is, God was being faithful to Abram and the promise, Thou shalt be a father of many nations. There was a tremendous growth spurt. This was a stunning thing for the people and the Pharaoh in Egypt to behold how a small family comes down and all of a sudden multiplies into three million people. Okay, you go out and you build a development. You see, we're going to go build this little development out here and we're going to build enough so that uh, a few families can live on this corner here. And we build a little cul-de-sac and a few houses and that easily holds the uh, ten families that are there. And then in a matter of a few generations, there are three million people living on that cul-de-sac. That's a stunning amount of growth. You don't see population growth like that. That's a stunning thing. That's the first thing I wanted to see historically. But the second thing I observed as I looked at the verse very carefully as I started to have uh, thoughts of Thomas Malthus who was someone that lived in the 1800s that did studies on what he thought was uh, the population growth. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied anything on population growth, but um, if you were to take a look at the population curve in billions... So we're going to look at billions over here on this side. And we're going to look at time. It's very interesting to observe the population growth that has occurred in the history of the world. Now, he says here, look at the 17th verse in Acts chapter 7. He says, when the time of the promise drew nigh, a promise which God had made to Abraham, that's a parenthetical remark. In other words, it's in a positive between two commas. You can remove the apositive and read it. When the time of the promise drew nigh, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Now, this is all happening in relation to promise to Abraham, to a Jewish promise. But I just want you to observe something because God is putting something here for us to, to watch carefully if, if we do pay attention to the Scriptures. Now, population growth, in the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Egypt is a type of the flesh. Egypt is a type of the world of the flesh, of unsaved people. Now, if you were to study world history, at the time that the Lord Jesus Christ came and ministered, at the, around the time of the cross, there were 300 million people in the world. And if you were to follow this population curve out, and I studied it, across the first millennium, 300 million, 350, 400, back to 350, it just hovers around the area of 300 million to 1000 A.D. And then if you continue to follow it, it moves along and moves along and slowly you begin to see some population growth occurring after 1500 A.D. And then something very stunning occurs. Follow this curve. These are real numbers, folks. These are not extrapolations. These are interpolations of true data. 
Extrapolation is to go beyond the data. Interpolate is just to connect the points. I connected the points here for 1 billion, which occurred in 1804, 2 billion, which occurred in 1927, 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion, which occurred in 1999. And there's a stunning growth, population growth, occurring. Now, to the lost man, this has been very troubling. We went from eight people off of Noah's flood. Eight people in, uh, when was that, uh, 2348 B.C. And we went from eight people to 300 million people at the time of the cross. And then it took 1,800 years to get to one billion. All told, it took 40 centuries to get from eight to one billion. 4,000 years to go from eight to one billion. To get the first one billion people on the earth, it took 40 centuries. To get the next billion, it took one century. To get the next billion, it took 40 years. To get between five and six billion, it took 12 years. The people are growing and multiplying in Egypt. Why? Because the time of the promise is drawing nigh. Read the verse. Read the verse. When the time of the promise drew nigh. I understand there's a historical, and we looked at it. There is a prophetic reference in this verse. Population growth is scaring the world. Why? They don't understand it. They're saying there are not enough resources. Let me show you some verses in the Bible. I just want to show you some verses. God's got this whole thing worked out. This entire thing is worked out. This population growth thing isn't catching God by surprise. He prophesies it in the Bible. He's going to provide for it. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. There are a lot of doomsayers wrongly, uh, wrongly prophesying about population growth. And, and they're concerned about uh, too many mouths and not enough food. God's got this worked out. But there is a doomsayer in the Bible warning that when you see this occur, the time of the promise is drawing nigh, which God promised to Abraham. And one of the things was, I'm going to give you a land. And he's getting ready to give him the land. And that's why population growth is occurring right now. God's getting ready to come back and give Abraham the land. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Now here, I want to show you how the world has it backwards and how God has it right. The world says there are too many mouths and not enough goods. And as the mouths increase, there will be insufficient goods and people will die and there will be famines everywhere. And They got it wrong. And I'm going to show you it's just the opposite and God predicts it. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse 11. When goods increase... They that are increased eat them. The goods will increase first before the population will increase. The truth of the matter is, notice the population growth curve here. It begins to bump up after 1500 with the Industrial Revolution. I was reading a, a book, uh, Volume 4, Basic History of the United States, The Growth of America by Clarence B. Carson. And Carson is observing the rapid growth and expansion that occurred in the middle of the 1800s, the middle of the 19th century, had a lot to do with the explosive growth of the steel industry. Until the time of the Civil War, steel was primarily used just for fine tools and cutlery. It was too expensive and too difficult to make for ordinary uses. But that changed rather quickly after 1857 when Henry Bessemer in England devised an inexpensive process for refining steel. While his process is better known, a few years earlier, an American named William Pig Iron Kelly patented a process for the conversion of pig iron to steel. And these claims resolved together in 1866 and thereafter steel burgeoned, steel making burgeoned in the United States and in England. And goods increased and agricultural equipment increased and the ability to till the soil increased and they multiplied pharma put and when goods increased, then they that are increased that eat them, then the population increase began to follow. You see the tremendous growth that followed after the Industrial Revolution. God had this all worked out. And it's all in preparation for the promise. Now, let me show you. There's more to it. I just wanted to show you how this occurred. 
through the mechanism of soil management and agricultural technique in the Industrial Revolution, this is beginning to allow this curve to go up. This curve didn't go up before that time because people wouldn't have been able to be fed. And God was providing for the mouths. See, every one of those souls that are born, God is the one that puts the spirit in those little children. And he's going to see to it that there's plenty of food out there. You say, well, there are famines. Yeah, it's because of governments that mismanage yes. and despots that keep the food. But there's plenty of food down here. There's enough agricultural output on this planet right now to feed 20 billion people. And there's only six. It's the mismanagement and the sin of man. Yes. It's the goodness of God endureth. Now, that's the first thing I want you to observe. Now, the second thing to observe is he says this will, the time of the promise draws nigh, then there will be an increase in a growth in the people. The goods will increase, so they'll be able to sustain the growth, but the time of the promise is drawing nigh. I'm getting ready to give the land unto Abraham. That's why we're seeing this, folks. Now, turn to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. How did this happen? How do we go from one to two to three to four to five billion people? Because God allowed the man to have the wisdom to make the goods to, to sustain the mouths that were born and, the, and the, those little children. But there's one other reason too in the time of the promise. Psalm 92 and verse 7. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt. These are lost people. And when the wicked spring is the grass... And when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Armageddon is real, folks. And, and now it's increasing. And unfortunately, transgression and wickedness is increasing with it. Those little children that are born, unfortunately, are being born to people that are, Jesus said, if someone stumbles this little child and hinders this little child from coming unto me, it would be better that a millstone were tied around his neck and he'd be thrown in the deep. And today the wicked are increasing and stumbling little children from coming to Jesus. And as they multiply and increase, God says, they're springing as the grass and the workers of iniquity are flourishing and they shall be destroyed forever because the time of the promise is drawing nigh. The principle occurred before in the time of the Noahic flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. These principles are repetitive. And God sets them forth, verily, verily. God requireth the thing that had passed, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. He wants us to know history, or we're doomed to repeat it. And He'd like us to know His story, which is the story of Calvary's cross, so we'll be saved from the wrath to come. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, <laughs> then the, the iniquity began to increase. The sons of God took the daughters of men. They took them wives, all of which they chose. There was polygamy and adultery. And God said, My spirit shall not strive with man. He is also flesh. God saw, verse 5, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. How we are like a, born like a wild ass's colt. And how we wander the wicked and we go astray from the moment of birth speaking lies. And when we see this population curve, we, we, we better not be afraid of famine. We better be afraid of judgment. And that's what God's pointed forth. And that's what's pointed forth right through it prophetically in Acts chapter 7. What a brilliant prophecy God's putting in there. When the people grow and multiply in Egypt, it's because the time of the promise is drawing nigh. And we saw it once with Noah. And we saw it twice with the people in Egypt. And we're seeing it the third time today. And you better watch out. Because three strikes and you're out. The world has had its way with sin long enough. And God's pointing it out for us right here in Acts chapter 7. Going back to where we're in Acts chapter 7. Stunning, stunning revelations in the Word of God. I mean, you read the lost people and their confusion over this and we know why this is happening. By the way, do you know what they call this? The, the scientists that study this? They call this the J-curve. Because it's shaped kind of like a J. Isn't that curious? At the name of Jesus shall every knee bow. Amen. 
in heaven, in earth, and things under the earth. It's the J-curve. God's pointing it right out for you. All the scientists see it. They call it the J-curve. I often wonder about some of the, the things they come up with in science. E equals mc squared. I understand the E is energy. I understand the M is matter. But why is C the speed of light? That's what it stands for. JC. I mean, God puts it everywhere so the scientists are stumbling over it on a daily basis when they do their scientific studies. Curious. All right, coming back to where we were in Acts chapter 7. When the time of the promise draws nigh, the people will grow and multiply. They did once before and they're doing it again now. Verse 18, till another king arose which knew not Joseph. Another king arose. They were in Egypt. There were Egyptian kings known as the pharaohs. But this is another king that's arising. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Historically, what had happened was the nation of Egypt was overrun for a short while by a an opposing army that took control. And it's, and it's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. Verse 4. For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Another king arose in Egypt for a short period, the, the Hiscops king, I believe they call it in secular history. And he was an Assyrian king. An invading army had overtaken Egypt for a short while. And he was an Assyrian king. But the point of this king was uh, a reference that God is putting forth in typology. And God uses real people as types. We see this throughout the scriptures, the way the Lord works. It says another king Another king. Who is this other king? Well, Daniel, chapter 7. This Assyrian is a type that God puts forth. A historical truth, but a prophetic type of what's going to happen in the near future. As the people are growing and multiplying in Egypt and the population curve is growing, what's going to happen to God's people as the time of the promise draws nigh? Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel is given a dream and visions. Verse 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And here he sees, verse 3, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And Daniel is given a picture of what is going to happen to his people during the times of the Gentiles. The Gentiles that dwell in Egypt. As the world multiplies and God's people, the Jews, are no longer the head of nations, they're the tail of nations, and all the other nations are coming against them. And he gets a picture of the, the prophetic dealings of the Gentile nations of the nation of Babylon, and then Medio Persia, and then Greece. And then Rome. And not only this, verse 7, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And then there's a... Is that a, a semicolon there? I think that's what that's called. A, a dot over a comma, a semicolon. And what's happening is the first half of that verse, he's referring to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire that subjected the nation of Israel at the time of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when Christ was turned over to Pilate and the Roman Emperor. But the semicolon separates from the first coming and the second coming, and the second coming, and it had ten horns. That is the revised Roman Empire with the ten kings that are going to come up in the very near future as the people grow and multiply in Egypt. And God's Folks, the Jews are under subjection to the Antichrist empire. And it says, verse 8, And I considered the horns, the ten kings, and look at this. And behold, there came up among them, look at another little horn. Now, if you were to keep your finger there, and you were to go back to where you were in Acts, notice the wording. Acts chapter 7. 
and verse 18, till another king. Back in Daniel 7, another little horn. Say, well, that's a stretch. Well, stay in Daniel 7 with me for a minute and skip down to verses 23 and 24. And verse 23, as the dream is given in interpretation to Daniel, he says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. That's all that happened at the first coming, second coming. And ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise in the revived Roman Empire of the end time when God comes back to save his nation. Watch it. And another, this is another king. See, there are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. He shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three of the kings. This is the other king, another king that arose. Historically, the Assyrian. Historically, different than the Egyptian king. Prophetically, the Assyrian. Prophetically, different than a human king. Why is he so? Because he's going to be half man, half devil. That's the king, the Antichrist, that's going to arise and persecute God's people. You can turn to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 1. The Lord looking forward to the day when he has mercy on his people and delivers them. Verse 1, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. The day's coming when the Jews are going to get that land that God promised to Abram when he was asleep. And it's going to happen when the people grow and multiply in Egypt and another king arises that knows not Joseph and is going to persecute God's people. And in this chapter, this is the famous chapter, of course, verse 12, showing the spirit that's behind the mystery of iniquity. Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? It's by the spirit of Lucifer, by the spirit of the opposer, Satan, the the Antichrist will come forth and weaken the nations. And in this particular chapter, as he goes through and he shows, you see, you know, people come to me with these books about the Masons are doing this and this group is doing that and, and this religious cult is doing that and they're all worried about this stuff. You know, God doesn't mention the Masons and He doesn't mention the religious cults because He gets to the heart of the matter and what's inside of every one of those causing the problem is right here. It's Satan. The mystery of iniquity works because of the spirit of uncleanness of the foul bird that's inside of them. It doesn't matter the outward manifestation. God says, stop getting your eyes on the outward, make righteous judgment, and understand what's going on inside. Beloved, try the spirits. Better watch out for the outward appearance because they may come with a white shirt and a tie and a jacket and look like an evangelical minister. You need to try the spirits of what's inside them. And so he's warning us in Isaiah 14. And notice as he works his way through this, as he talks about breaking down Lucifer and, and uh, verse 24, The Lord of hosts has, thw- has sworn, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. This is the judgment that he's going to bring on Lucifer and his nations. As I have purposed, so shall it stand that I will break the Assyrian in my land. Another king that knew not Joseph. Again, a picture of half man, half devil, powered by Lucifer. That's the other king, the other horn that will raise up. And the whole world will wonder after the beast because he's going to have a false resurrection. And that's a picture that he's giving you right here. And, and this other king that knew not Joseph back in Acts chapter 7, historically, and also prophetically. But historically, verse 19, the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers. I love the wording. It's very perfect in your authorized King James Bible. Now the serpent was more subtle 
than any beast of the field. He's pointing it out for you. The very spirit that was at work back there in Egypt when the Assyrian king was persecuting God's people is the same spirit that will be work in the future when God's people are being persecuted by the Antichrist. Subtly, evil entreated, saying right here, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. Now the example of that first pointed for you is in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, when the people are growing and multiplying, it grieved the nation of Egypt and the Assyrian king. Verse 15, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, Exodus 1.15, the name of the other Pua, and said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and they're you know, delivering their babies, and you see them upon the stools, that's the way they did deliveries back then, they didn't lay in the beds with their feet up in stirrups, they would sit upon the stools. By the way, that's a smart way for a woman to have a baby. Why fight gravity? I don't know what modern science does, what it does. I mean, sometimes I wonder about modern science. I often wonder about it. But it's a false god that changes every 20 or 30 years. Maybe they'll get it right in the near future. Um, See them upon the stools. If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. The baby's delivered. If it's a boy, you kill him. Now, and I don't know if they did this like a partial term abortion. In other words, let the boy come, a partial birth abortion. Is that what they call it? Partial birth abortion. They let the baby come by uh, some way, uh, the, the feet come out and the bottom comes out and then they look at it and, they, oh, it's a boy. And then they poke up a, a rod and they kill it in the head. That, I mean, that goes on today in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. All right. This is the wickedness going on today in Egypt. It went on back then. What was the spirit behind it? When you see someone that's quote-unquote pro-choice, you want to know the spirit that's in them? It's the spirit that we read about right here. It's the spirit of the Assyrian. You know, it says in Proverbs, Proverbs says, All they that hate me love death. The choice they're for is death. And they love death. And this went on a long time ago as the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the devil himself, was working in this Assyrian to kill these babies. Of course, the midwives didn't exactly do it. Verse 22, So Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, cast him into the river. In other words, who cares about partial uh, birth abortion or a full-term abortion? Look, at just outright infanticide. Take the baby and throw him in the river. Now, now you'd say, that went on a long time ago. Never go on again. Well, first off, Matthew chapter 2, Herod did the same thing. When he inquired of the wise men, said, when was that baby born? Uh, Diligently inquired, when did you first see that star? It's about two years ago, huh? Then he had his henchmen to kill all the babies that were two years old and younger. Same spirit. The, 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 The spirit of death. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning, Jesus said. A murderer and a liar. The truth abides not on him and he loves death. He wants to murder bodies and souls. Thankfully, he can't kill souls. But if he gets a body before the soul saved, by default, the soul ends up with him. But I want to tell you, I was reading a book here by uh, Tom DeRosa, Evolution's Fatal Fruit, how Darwin's tree of life brought death to millions. You know, people will often say, you'll often hear this said, Religion has caused more death and wars than anything else in the history of mankind. Actually, wrong. It hasn't. Atheism and Darwinism has caused more death to millions than all the religions put together. And in this book here, he reviews the history of what happened through Darwin's teachings. And after Darwin, along came a man that was one of his disciples by the name of Ernst Haeckel. Ernst H-A-E-C-K-E-L. He was a a German scientist, uh, described as a bombastic. He enthusiastically took Darwin's theory of the origin of the species, a a quasi-scientific theory, basically a bad philosophy, and we don't have time to teach it now, but there's been other times we've taught it, and we'll teach it again, and there are many good people writing on it. But he took this quasi-scientific theory and enthusiastically turned broad social application of this theory. 
which was easy to do because Darwin's theory really is more philosophy than it is science. So it was easy to give social application because sociology is basically a philosophy. It's not really a good science. Folks, there's only a few hard sciences. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you study epistemology and the tree of knowledge and the various kinds of knowledge that mankind and disciplines have come up with, there are only a few hard sciences. Astronomy is a hard science. Physics is a hard science. Chemistry is a hard science. Biochemistry is a hard science. Mathematics is a hard science. And apart from that, the rest of them are so soft in terms of their scientific application that they are sciences falsely so-called. Psychology is so soft a science, it's really not a science, it's a philosophy. Sociology is so soft a science, it's really not a science, it's, it's a philosophy. Evolution is so soft a science. Biology itself, stunningly so, is a, is a mix of some hard science and a lot of soft science. And you have to be able to have discerning mind to tease it out. And what they're counting on is the sheep that cannot discern. And they make you believe when these guys get up with white coats that they're dealing with hard scientific facts. And usually they're dealing with assumptions. And here he takes this this soft science that Darwin came up with, this philosophy, and he begins to apply it socially. And he writes a book in uh, 1868 called uh, Naturlike Schopfungsgerstichke, which is the natural history of creation. And in this particular book, he, he comes up with a theory called the theory of recapitulation, which is a fraudulent science where he takes a bunch of uh, wood, woodcut prints of embryos from different species. And he, he readjusts the woodcut prints and puts them all scale to the same size. And he makes it look like uh, originally he used dog and human embryos. And then later on, he made prints of tortoise, chicken, uh, fish, And he claimed that when a baby is born, it goes through the same type of embryologic development that a fish and a chicken and a dog goes through. And he calls it the theory of recapitulation, and therefore we all came from the same ancestor. Now, the problem with his work was his fraud was exposed by two scientists within 10 years. Al Rudemeyer, the professor of zoology and comparative anatomy at the University of Basel, uh, took a look at, the, at what he did, and he said there is considerable manufacturing of the evidence that was perpetrated. The author has been very careful not to let the reader be aware of this state of affairs, how he took these wood prints and he readjusted the size of them. They don't look anything alike. Uh, also, uh, a professor by the name of Wilhelm Hiss, a well-known embryologist and professor of anatomy at the University of Leipzig, uncovered this fraud too, and he showed that Haeckel had doctored all the drawings presented in his book. This was known to be a fraud within 10 years, and yet today it's still found in encyclopedias and in textbooks given to our children in the schools. I looked at the World Book Encyclopedia yesterday, and it's still presented as a scientific fact. It's fraudulent science. I wish he had just left it to science, but he moves forward, And he goes from science to philosophy. And what he says is, he says, the primary theoretical application of this biogenetic law, that the embryos repeat the stages of evolution, makes me wonder and apply these concepts to human ethics and the value of life. Since a human being really is no different than a fish, which we catch, or chickens, which we cook, or dogs, which we use as pets, he said, um, why can we not just consider this, that there are human beings that as they develop, we see that they have shortcomings. They're mentally retarded. They're physically handicapped. They're not very bright. They're not very useful to society. Why do we not just purify the race by getting rid of these weak ones? In other words, infanticide is really a good thing because these babies, these children are truly just in a primeval evolutionary stage. They haven't met the next stage of evolution to full civilized man. They're still like a primitive caveman in their development so we can easily dispose of them because they're similar to unwanted animals. I suggest we use small doses of cyanide or morphine to free the parents of the burden of taking care of these children for the rest of their lives. Abortion and infanticide are equal, Heckel said. You say, well, who would believe that? Well, move forward a little while into Nazi Germany and look at how Hitler used those very 
methods to kill Gentiles and Jews as they did away with the mentally retarded, as they did away with old people that they felt had outlived their usefulness to uh, society. They had euthanasia for old people. They had infanticide for young people. They had partial term abortion. They had full abortions. And this went on. A woman by the name of... Uh, this is the mystery of iniquity at work. And the very same thing is repeating itself today. Why? As the time of the promise draws now. You didn't see this stuff in the 15, 16, 17, 1800s. It's all being born this fatal fruit today. It takes a couple generations for these ideas to percolate from the mind to the tongue to the hands. That's the way sin works. And we're seeing it today as the time of the promise draws nigh. A woman by the name of Margaret Sanger uh, started what was called the birth control movement and began Planned Parenthood worldwide, which promotes abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia. And we're seeing this today. Matter of fact, there's a, a modern um, philosopher a professor at Princeton by the name of uh, Peter Singer. And uh, he, he approves and, and writes in a, a, a writing he just did recently called The Writings of an Ethical Life. And it was a big uh, philosophical treatise that was put out around the world and uh, in many universities. And he advocates infanticide, euthanasia, I mean beyond abortion. I mean outright killing babies that are born just like the Pharaoh said, cast them into the river. Infanticide, euthanasia, and he also approves of bestialism and necrophilia, which are perverted sex acts, which I'm not surprised of. And somebody was querying him on that and says, can you see that there's basically no difference, Mr. Singer, Dr. Singer, he's a professor of philosophy at Princeton, the Ivy League, and they're covered with moss over there. They need to get out and, and, and get some fresh air. And, uh, and they said, can you see there's no difference between what you're doing and what the Nazis did? And he tried to defend himself. He said, wait a second. There's a big difference between what the Nazis did and what I'm advocating. And he's talking about the, the Nazis was racially biased. And the Nazis were trying to eliminate uh, a social ballast and useless mouths. Where I'm saying that anyone that wants to do this gets to choose freely uh, whether the, an old person says, I would like to die, or whether a parent says, this uh, baby is too much of a burden for me. But the thing to be pointed out, as uh, Marvin Olasky points out, is the common denominator is the same. The common denominator is it's okay to kill socially inconvenient people. See, Hitler says the government will decide who's inconvenient. And Singer says, let the individual decide who's inconvenient. But the common denominator is we kill him. Why? Because another king is arising right now in the hearts of people that knows not Joseph as the people are multiplying right now. What's going to happen is doctrinally, what you're going to see is worldwide persecution of the Jewish people during the time of the tribulation. The very things that they watch in aghast and horror on the History Channel and Discovery Channel as, as Hitler is marching and having all those thousands of people before him will be reproduced in such tremendous numbers that, that Hitler is going to look like little Bo Peep. As the world of the Egyptian Gentiles is going to murder God's people doctrinally. All right, back to where we were in, in uh, Acts chapter 7. Seven minutes, we're running out of time. So what we will do is we'll wind it up because I wanted, to, I wanted to finish up with that 19th verse. The same, this other king, a type of the Antichrist, dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. One of the reasons they're going to cast out those young Jewish children is 144,000 of those young Jewish children are going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and are going to be out there preaching in the streets and the world is going to want to persecute them because the world and the flesh and the devil hate Jesus Christ and His glorious gospel. So next week we will continue as Stephen the Scriptorian in verses 20 through 40 begins to recount the history of Moses, his birth, his adoption, his wisdom, his attempt to deliver the people naturally, and then his wilderness experience where he meets God, and then his call and his obedience. And we'll have a prayer. If there's any questions, we'll take them after the camera's off. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, uh, 
the beautiful uh, teaching and the pictures that Stephen gives us in the scriptural history, the only true and faithful words of history that have ever been recorded, Lord. We thank you for this. And we must look to your son, Jesus, not even to your people. And your people must look to Jesus. Help us, Lord. The transgressors of the world do multiply. They do increase. They have evil imaginations and they deal subtly. Help us, Lord, as we live to uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us the love of Christ like Stephen had in the midst of this persecution to lay not the sin to their charge, but forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Have you forgiven us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll have a little break and then we'll have a wonderful service with Brother Bill.